गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग लेट मी से हाउ हैप्पी आई एम टू बी विद यू दिस मॉर्निंग आई हैव ऑलरेडी बीन टोल्ड दैट द कांग्रेगेशन हियर प्रेजेंट it represents a number of countries from within the continent of africa and from outside of africa and that it is in a manner of speaking the united nations in microcosm <laughs> i have been asked to speak on a subject that allows me Uh, to mention a number of things but because this is a christian setting i've chosen to predicate my speech upon three bible verses uh, the very first one is to be found in the book of daniel and you will remember that in the book of daniel the story is told of king nebuchadnezzar and how he conquered the territory that was occupied by the jewish people and we are told that immediately he made that conquest he asked one of his officers to identify from within the ranks of the conquered people intelligent individuals and the bible records in that book of daniel that they identified daniel they also identified an individual called ananiah and they identified another individual called mishael and a third one called azaria and the bible proceeds to tell us that they were all renamed belshazzar shadrach meshach and abednego and there is a sense in which it is those given names that they are known by throughout the ages and we are told is that they were schooled in the arts and that they were some of the most intelligent individuals if one were to be dramatic about it one may say that they gained admission into the university of nebuchadnezzar and if one says so that there were certain protocols to be followed once you joined the university of nebuchadnezzar number 1 that you are to eat from the king's table and to drink the king's wine but these individuals were so wedded to their own conviction for their own god that they made a request of the king's attendants that they be allowed to take food that was not served from the king's table and we are told that after 10 days they were better than everybody else and we are further told that on the day of graduation when they were examined they were 10 times better than everybody else that is the first thus in the bible the first chapter in the bible upon which i'll predicate my presentation the second chapter in the bible on which i shall predicate my presentation is to be found in the book of first kings at chapter 18 it is a story with which you are familiar is the story that gives us ahab in the bible and give us gives us one of the most notorious women in the bible jezebel and we are told that there had been no rain in that land for a long time 
And the story we are told of a man called Obadiah, who was sent by Ahab to go and look out for the prophet Elijah. And we were told how this Obadiah was scared. And we are also told how God instructed this Elijah to go to the palace of Ahab. And we are told how when Elijah confronted Ahab, he told him that I am the only one of the prophets of the Lord who is still alive. That is not to say that Obadiah had not hidden 50 others, 50 in one cave and 50 in another cave. And we are told that Elijah said, let us not be of two opinions. If indeed God is God, let us worship God. And if Baal is God, let us worship Baal. And we are told that he asked, bring out the 450 prophets of Baal. And the 400 prophets of Asherah who have been dining at the table of Jezebel. And there was a competition, if you may, that took place at Mount Carmel. And the story is told of how they prayed unto their God and how they were mocked by Elijah and nothing came to pass. And ultimately when Elijah had his opportunity, we are told that fire came down from heaven and it consumed everybody else. And we are told how the prophets who are of Baal were then executed. Then the final chapter in the Bible, book in the Bible, if you may, that I want to refer to, is the book of the prophet Joshua, chapter 24 to be exact. And this is a very critical time when Joshua has taken over from Moses and the Israelites are about to go into the promised land. And we are told that Joshua gathered all the children of Israel and the story is told of how he reminded the people when, when they were across the river that Abraham's father Terah Worship gods other than the real God. And he tells the people, Choose you now whom you shall serve. Shall you serve the gods that your fathers worshipped across the river? Or the Lord of the Amorites in whose land you dwell? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I've chosen to predicate my conversation with you this morning. Three chapters in the Bible. Because even if you chose not to be a Christian, they are relevant, particularly to young people and particularly to young Africans. And I'm acutely aware that there are other people who are not Africans and that is also acutely relevant to you. Because I've been asked to talk about the time is now. And let me speak to my African brethren first. Just this morning when I woke up, I was listening to somebody who is going to be the presidential candidate in Sierra Leone, the former director general of UNIDO. And he was wondering to himself, why is it that Africa continues to punch below her weight, economically, politically, and otherwise? We are a continent of one billion people, but we cannot feed ourselves. We are a continent of young people, 
But there is a sense in which we have no faith in ourselves. We are continent with resources like no other continent on earth. Yet there is a sense in which we are still in the gates of human civilization. We are a continent which in the words of Afro-pessimists is a scar on the conscience of humanity. Which begs the question, what is it that we are not doing right? This particular individual said. And this is what he said. That Africa still suffers from the Garden of Eden syndrome. And the Garden of Eden syndrome is that God has placed you into the Garden of Eden and you partake of the fruits without any labor. We have forgotten that after the fall of man, there was that divine instruction, go out and subdue the world. Because from the sweat of thy brow, thou shalt eat. There is a sense in which the three books in the Bible that I talk about speak to my agenda. They speak to the entire question of choice. And let me tell you one thing. The African continent has been traumatized and remains traumatized to date. Africans who are enslaved. Africans who are colonized. Africans claim that we gained our independence, but the neo-colonial project is alive and well. Speak to Ngugi Wathiong, he'll tell you that our minds are still colonized. And that is why he talks about decolonizing the mind. Because throughout the ages, the battle has always been the battle of the minds. That is where it is won and lost. And one of the things that I've discovered over the ages is that those who want to control you, the first thing that they do is to change your name. Even God changes his name when he wants to deal with you. When you are Abraham, he makes you Abraham. When you are Sarai, he makes you Sarah. And the very first thing that the colonialists did was to change our names, to convince us that a Christian name could only be Andrew and Mary and Jane and all these other names. That Kamau cannot be a Christian name. <laughs> that Njoroge cannot be a Christian name. And we believed it. And I'm submitting to us that there is a sense in which our minds are not free. I'm submitting to us that even your generation is not free. I'm submitting to us that in that book of Daniel, even though their names were changed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Belshazzar, there is something that they did not allow to change in them. They refused to eat meat or anything that was sacrificed to the idols. And you remember that day when Nebuchadnezzar put forth an image which was six cubit high and six cubit wide. And they reported to Nebuchadnezzar that this young man had refused to worship this idol. The young man said, we shall not worship it because the Lord that we serve is going to save it. But even if he does not, we shall not bow down. And the story is then told. That when they were thrown into the fire, those who threw them into the fire were consumed by the fire. But within a few minutes, Nebuchadnezzar himself said, but we threw in three of them, but there appears to be a fourth man who is like the son of the gods. I'm submitting to us that at all critical times in history, we have to make painful choices. I'm speaking to you Africans who are Christian, who are present here. What choices have you made? Have you made choices to run away to the United States to get the green card? Is that your choice? Have you made a choice to run away to Europe to flip hamburger? 
Have you made a choice to run away, to go to Europe and to be humiliated at the embassies of the United States of America, Australia and the United Kingdom? I'm submitting to us that we must change because the divine instruction is that each one of us must make do with what we have. It cannot be right that a continent that is so blessed has our young men and women with only one ambition to go to the United States. I know families where when wives are pregnant, they want to go to the United States that they may give birth there, that their child may be a citizen of the United States of America. The United States of America was not built by an army of angels. No, it was built by human beings. And I'm submitting to us that going forward like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we must make a choice. And I'm submitting to us that if your Christianity is the kind of Christianity that only appeals to your emotions and make you feel good without making you good, that is not Christianity. Because there is a variety of Christianity today that makes you feel good, but it doesn't make you good. And I'm submitting to us that we must change now. Because if we don't change now, you are going to be subdued by other civilization. And as I said at one forum, and I repeat it now, there are two ways of being at the dinner table of civilization. You can be at the dinner table as a diner or as a waiter. Choose you now. Whether you want to be a diner or a waiter, choose you now. But even as I proceed, I have not forgotten that there is another book, that there is the battle between Elijah and the gods of Baal. Today, we have erected unto ourselves gods of Baal. I go to many churches, and there is the prosperity gospel. The gospel that tells us that the church is a casino. We are depending on how much you pay as a tithe or givings, then you'll get blessing. That is not the God that I worship. And if there was such a God, I would refuse to worship such a God. The God that I worship and the Christ that I follow, I remember on that day when an old woman had given the smallest contribution, he said, that woman has given the most because there was sacrificial giving. We must now interrogate our Christianity because Paul says, I would want you to be like the Christians of Berea. Because the Christians of Berea, once you'd preach to them, they would go to the gospel and ask, are you preaching the right thing or you are preaching make good gospel? I'm submitting to us that at critical moments in history, there has always been a choice. And this is what Elijah is confronting the people with. His, he says, for how long shall you waver between two opinions? If God is God, worship God. And if Baal is God, worship Baal. I'm submitting to you that the time for choice is now. If material things are the things you want to worship, if you think that having Lamborghini, if you think like having Ferrari and all these other goodies is the right thing, then you can go on. But the last time I checked, greed is insatiable. It's like drinking salty water. The more you drink, the more you want. So choose you now. You Christians and Africans shall come to the white men who are present in this room shortly. I'm submitting to us, and there is a preacher that I love for only one thing. Sometimes I think he go overboard on his love for Israel, John Hagee. And he says one thing that I love, the uncompromising message of Jesus Christ. It is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So that there is no question of humoring you in the church. It is telling you as it is. And I'm saying that even as we are waiting for heaven and heaven is come, will come in the fullness of time, in the intervening period, we must eat. 
in the intervening period we must go to school in the intervening period we must make africa great and we can make africa great what pains me most is when i see young men dying in the mediterranean sea you know a long time ago they took africans to europe and caribbean a long time ago and they were wailing and kicking and i've seen the dramatization of alex haley's roots and i've seen how in roots a young man is taken from the gambia kunta kinte and i've seen how kunta kinte refuses to change his name and they call him Toby, but he says, I'm Kunta Kinte. Ultimately, for strategic reasons, he accepts the name Toby, but he retains Kunta Kinte throughout the ages. And 200 years later, Alex Haley is able to trace his roots. But today, young Africans are going to Europe willingly to be enslaved. It's slavery by another name. Because you are paying wages, you are paid wages that can barely keep you alive. I'm submitting to you who are here, Africa is the land of action. I'm submitting to you here that the Europeans will never respect you if you don't respect yourselves. Because respect is earned, not given. I'm submitting to you that you will never sit on the table of civilization as equal partners. Unless you are demonstrated that you are worthy of being a diner rather than a waiter. Choose you now what you shall do. The book of the prophet Joshua is also another book. It speaks to the Israelites. The Israelites were in captivity for 400 years. They brought Moses unto them. Moses delivered them, but at critical moments they wanted to go back to the flesh pots of Egypt. At critical moments, God parted the Red Sea. At critical moments, there was a pillar of fire to separate them from the Pharaoh. But they still went back to their old ways. And an aging and a dying Joshua is telling them, the point for making the choice is now. When we were taken away from Ur of the Chaldeans, Terah was worshipping idols. Abraham was worshipping idols. There was a change in him and he became Abraham. And now you have come to the land of the Amorites and you are worshipping their God. Choose you now whom you shall serve. The Lord God Oh, the Lord of the Amorites. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I'm submitting to us now. Choose you now whom you shall serve. The Lord whom you only serve on Sundays. Or the Lord that is imminent and must be served every minute. Choose you now. As Christians and as Africans. One can go on and on. But let me turn to the white people who are present in this assembly, who are our brethren. You came here by divine instruction to evangelize Africa. But in your land, God no longer has the opportunity to operate. That is why I'm happy to see you here. Because Africa now leads in evangelization. And this is how God operates. There was a time when the white men came here to evangelize. They lost God. I'm not saying that there is a godless society, but there is a sense in which when one travels to Europe, one sees cathedrals being converted into discotheques and museums. And here we are struggling to operate in a tent. How I wish that we could have the faith spoken of in the Bible, that we could uproot the cathedrals that they may settle here. But I know that that is wishful thinking, that there is no cabracadabra in this thing that I know. <laughs> but I'm submitting to us that your presence here is a good thing. It's a demonstration that we are children of God, children of a God of diversity. You know, 
And this is very ecumenical. Some of you will be offended, but I do not care whether you are offended or not. The great Mahatma Gandhi, whom I respect, was not a Christian, but at a critical moment one day he said that he remembers one day in his homeland in Gujarat when the person who was presiding over the service read from the Hindu Gita through to the Jewish Torah, through to the Muslim Quran, and to the Christian Bible, reading from one book to the other, as if it did not matter which book was being read as long as God was being worshipped. And there is a sense in which I found power in that. You do not know the whole truth. None of us. We do not know how God operates. And that is why Christ tells us, judge not lest you be judged. There is a puritanical streak that sometimes we Christians, particularly those who are born again, have. We are quick to judge contrary to the divine instruction. Let us be slow to judge. Who knows how God operates? Who knows how he does his things? Because all of you, including myself, we are so sinful that if it was by works alone, none of you are heaven bound. None of you. You may think that you are good. You may think that you are doing all good things. But he says none of you is heaven bound except by the grace of God. And if we appreciate that, then we would be very humble. But even as I talk about these things and change now, I'm not unaware that I was asked to speak for 25 minutes. <laughs> and being aware that I was asked to speak for 25 minutes lets me now move with jet lag speed in the direction of my conclusion. What is it that I've been saying? I'm saying that we who have the advantage of knowing God, we are in a unique position because we may sin and throughout the Bible there are many sinners I used to wonder why God said that David was a man after his heart. This man David, who took Uriah's wife, this man David, who took Abigail, this man David, who sent Uriah to be killed, this man David, of whom the Israelites sang that Saul kills by the thousands, and David, by the tens of thousands, I said, how could he possibly be a man after God's heart? But then I made a discovery. That the man is so human, so prone to making mistakes and to sinning, but so devoted that when he sins, he goes to God with a contrite heart. And then I discovered that all of us must strive to do that which is good and right. Then I discovered that wherever we are, whatever we do, we must use our Christianity well. A friend of mine told me not so long ago that he was at an airport in the United Arab Emirates. And there was a signpost. Whether this story is true or apocryphal, I do not know, but I'll use it nevertheless. There was a sign that said, you can leave your things here. They are safe. They are no Christians here. <laughs> and the moral of the story is one that is not far to seek. We claim to be 80% Christians, and yet we are one of the most corrupt nations on earth. Where is our Christianity? We claim in Africa... To be immune from all these other things. I know there are Ethiopians here. And I'm not unaware that your economy is doing well. But yet the Oromo has a problem with the Tigrinya and the Tigrinya with the Amhara. So that when the chips are down, the blood of ethnicity is thicker than the blood of Christ. I know that there are Ugandans here. And I know that there are moments when being a Muganda is more important than being an Acholi or a Teso. The blood of ethnicity is thicker than the blood of Christ. And the people whom I love, the Rwandese, are here. How can we forget 20 years ago 
a people who speak one tongue, a people who live together, husband slaughters wives on the ground only that they labored them to see. In the churches of God, priests killed. The blood of ethnicity is thicker than the blood of Christ. And one can go on and on. The only country in Africa that appeared to have been vaccinated against ethnicity is Tanzania. The home of that great man, Julius Kambaragi Nyerere. They appear to have been vaccinated. But come to my Kenya. Oh, my Kenya. Oh, Kenya. Even now as we approach the elections and you are going to make the decision, I can assure you that there will be no change. Because the formations we have are merely tribal alliances. And if one were to be blunt about it, on one side... The Kalenjin elite and the Kikuyu elite have ganged up and they have hypnotized their tribesmen and persuaded them that it's only by electing them that their circumstances will change. It will not. On the other side, there is another arrangement called NASA. This is also an assembly largely of the Luo of Kenya, the Kamb, the Luhia. And a few other tribes and their leaders, the elite, have hypnotized their tribesmen. They cannot think nor reason. So that what we are going to have in Kenya on the 8th day of, of August is not an election on any issue. They will not talk about agriculture, about education, about unemployment, the critical things. It is going to be an ethnic census to determine which formation brings together the largest number of tribes. So those of you who think there will be dramatic change, you will be disappointed. As I said elsewhere in Kiswahili, Nyani ni wale wale, misitu ndiyo imabadilika. I'm saying that the monkeys are the same, the forests have changed. And if you ever doubted me, there was once a forest called Cod, there was once a forest called ODM, it has now changed into NASA. There was once a forest called URP, there was once a forest called TNA, it is now Jubilee. Nyani ni wale wale. Nahulka zaoni zile zile. So you who are here, you who are Kenyans, when you go to vote on the 8th, what will you be voting for? Agriculture, employment, or more <laughs> You who are from the Luo extraction, when you'll be voting, you'll you be voting Oduadu or health and education. Who will be tied to you? Because the question has always been choose you now whom you shall serve the Lord of the Amorites or the Lord God. As for me, and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You know, one of the things that I find painful is for anybody to tell me to vote an individual because he's from my ethnic group. It is the greatest insult. Why did I go to school? <laughs> you tell me what you are going to do about education. I'm about to conclude, timekeeper. The British had an election, have an election today. If you came to Kenya and listened to what you would think that there is an animal called election, which has never been seen by any human being since creation, <laughs> and that God has instructed that Kenya be the experimental ground. You listen to what is happening, yet elections are known. Is a competition of ideas. Within a few hours tomorrow, the day after, we'll know who is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and they'll be counting 50 million votes. In Kenya, we'll be counting no more than 10 million votes and Africans can't count. <laughs> when it comes to elections, Africans can't count. And Africans never lose elections. Africans are rigged. How can you run a continent like that? Yet we claim to be Christians. If you go to the Germans, they'll have an election. 
And within a few hours, they'll have results because it is a competition of ideas. You know, when, look, when you look at Europe, the reason why Europe is ahead of us, how many of you, and this is what I must conclude with, in the book of Matthews, the story is told of a businessman, I'll paraphrase it, who goes out on a long journey and then trusts his workers, one with one talent, the other one with two talents, and the other one with five talents. And the Bible record says he goes away for a long time. And when he comes back, he goes to the one who was given to, and he says, Lord, you gave me two, I've worked on it, and it's now four. And the master says, good work. And he goes to the one with five and says, Lord, you gave me five. And I've worked on it, it's now ten. Says, good work. And to the one with one talent, he says, I know you. You are a hard-hearted person who likes to reap where you have not sown. And therefore I kept it, here it is. And the master says, why shouldn't you then have given it to those who are in the business of giving interest? And the Bible records, and to those who do not have, even the little that they shall have shall be taken away, and it shall be given to those who have. We have, but we don't utilize. That is why God has now brought the Chinese to take it away from us. That is why God has brought all these people to take it away because we do not know what it is. I can go on and on. But what is the wisdom of going on and on? When it is so clear that we must make a choice. So I'm submitting to us in conclusion that this is the choice. The choice that we are confronted with is the choice that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were confronted with. To choose to worship the God idols erected by Nebuchadnezzar or to remain faithful to their agenda. The choice that you are confronted with is the choice that Elijah presented to the prophets of Baal. Choose you now. Do not waver between two opinions. If the Lord is God, serve the Lord. If Baal is God, serve Baal. And the latter day, Baals come in the form of cars, houses, and other earthly things. The other choice is the same one that Joshua gave to the Israelites. Choose you now whom you shall serve. The Lord whom your fathers worshipped across the river or the Lord or the God of the Amorites in whose land you serve. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. I'm submitting to us that you young Africans must change Africa. You young Africans must do something for Africa. And you are not going to do it by tweeting, no. You are not going to do it through Instagram, no. You are not going to do it through Facebook, no. You are not going to do it through social media, no. The last time I checked is that you must roll up your sleeves. You must roll up your sleeves and go into the arena of action. Suffer, sweat, plant the tree in the knowledge that those who plant the tree may never enjoy its shadow. But the joy is that the planter of the tree has planted the tree. Another generation will water the tree. Another generation will prune the tree. Another generation will enjoy her shade. God bless you.